After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing a large crowd coming towards him, Jesus says to Philip, where are we to buy bread so these people may eat? And we said this to test him, for he knew himself what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii, about seven months' wages, worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's this boy over here who's got five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves. When he'd given thanks, he distributed them to all of those who were seated, and so also the fish, as much as they had wanted. When they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up all the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. And when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, well, this, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Perceiving that then they were about to come and take him by force to make him a king, Jesus withdrew to the mountain by himself. And when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. They got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was dark, so Jesus has not yet to come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. Now when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus on the sea, coming near the boat. They were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Now on the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had only been one boat there. Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when'd you get here? When'd you come here? <laughs> Jesus answered, well, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, well, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. After this, many of his disciples turned back, no longer wanted to walk with him. So Jesus says to the twelve, well, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Jasmine. Good morning. I want to take a look at you, see who I'm looking at this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning again, Wakanda forever. <laughs> I see a couple of new faces in here, and for those that I haven't met, my name is Jasmine. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here, and I am house-sitting for our lead pastor, Vito Ayuto, once again. 
There is nobody like Jesus. And that's why for the last several weeks, we have been studying the I am statements of Jesus that are found in the book of John. These are statements that Jesus used to show us that he was doing the Father's will and that he could be trusted. And we're going to spend the next several weeks looking at other places in the book of John where Jesus reveals his identity. Today what we're going to do is look at a selection from John chapter 6, which you just heard read. It's really the moment when Jesus reveals his identity by walking on water. Um, I'm sure that more than likely you know this story. But what I'd like to do today is tell that story, looking at the events that come before and after it. Because by the end of chapter 6, what we see is that the disciples declare that they're going to follow Jesus. They're going to stay with him. And they're going to acknowledge that there's no one else like him and there's nowhere else to go. And my question is, what happened to them? What is it that convinced them that Jesus was worth following and staying with? And honestly, the answer to that question is the same thing that I hope happens to each and every single person in this room. They stayed with Jesus because they saw his power and his purpose. His power and his purpose, those are the two things that we're going to focus on this morning. But before we do that, I want to acknowledge that it's been a really big week. There's a lot of noise out there. And as I've been praying, I have pictured the Lord uh, using this church, using this space as a safe harbor, a bay where we can sort of pull in and pull away from that noise. And so we're not going to ignore what's taken place this week, but I want to be very thoughtful in how we do that. I want to slow it down this morning and play a little bit of jazz, so to speak. My mom would be very surprised to hear me say that. She actually ran a jazz radio station for many years when I was younger, and so she would always put the radio station on in the car so that she could listen to work. And I would always complain, put on Whitney Houston, put on Green Day, and she was like, no. I was not a fan of jazz back then, and I'm really not much of a fan of it now, but there is one element about jazz that I can appreciate now that I've gotten older. Uh, jazz has what we call intercalations in it. An intercalation is uh, when one thing gets layered in the middle of something else. So in jazz, you might have a song that's playing, and then suddenly this other tune comes in the middle. It might be a solo but eventually they'll get back to the original song. And intercalations are found in other places too, not just in music. They happen in science, like when molecules get inserted between each other. But the best intercalations are found in the Bible. Those are the moments when one story starts and then there's like an interruption and something else happens, but then the author will come back to the original story. It forms an ABA pattern, ABA. And when an ABA pattern is happening in the Bible, you better hold on because something important is about to take place. So that is what I wanna look at this morning the story of Jesus walking on the water, which is not just the story of Jesus walking on the water, it's really the story of Jesus feeding a crowd of 5,000, and then Jesus rescuing the disciples, and then we're going to see Jesus go right back to that same crowd that he has just fed. And so that's how we're going to walk through it this morning, looking at the story just that way, A, B, A. And along the way, I'll share just a couple of observations, and we're going to be cool, and we're going to listen to a little bit of Bible jazz. But first, let's pray. Jesus, we just sang that you have all of the authority. So if you want your glory to come down and rest on us, if you want to do something completely new today, you can do that, and we can be your vessels for it. We are saying yes 
to you, Jesus. Clean our hands. Purify our hearts. Help us to be more like you and think more like you and talk more like you. And for these next few moments, hold on to our to-do list, the things that we came in here with. We trust you with them. Help us to focus on your word and your presence. I pray all of this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Here we go. So, the story that I'll be telling is on your program. Chapter 6 begins with Jesus and the disciples, and they just landed on the far side of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, the Sea of Galilee, longer than it is wider. And so in, they're in this northern corner of the Sea of Galilee, and they tend to go back and forth between this corner. It's like a hotbed of ministry activity for them. And in verse 2, we find out that a large crowd has already been following Jesus because he has been healing people. And so his reputation is growing. And it's important that we remember that that's why they're already following him. Because when they come to him in a few moments, we have to remember that the excitement is already pretty high. Jesus and his disciples, they sit down on a hill, probably tired. But Jesus can now see the same crowd is coming. And so he turns to Philip and he says, where can we buy bread to feed all of these people? Philip is my favorite disciple because Philip is the practical one. Whenever you see him speak in scripture, he's going to hit you with the practical questions or the practical, helpful answer. It's all he wants to do is help. And so he gives it his best shot. He looks at this large crowd. Mind you, they're not seated yet. They're moving toward him. And so he looks at them. He does some guesstimation. And he says, Jesus, even if we had two-thirds of someone's annual salary, I'm not sure we would have enough money to feed all of these people. But of course, that's not what Jesus asked. He didn't ask how will we get the bread or how much bread will we need. He said, where will we get it from? To whom will we turn? What will our source be? And so Andrew offers up, there's a child here with five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus willingly accepts this because Jesus can do a lot with a little. It is not the quantity that matters so much when it comes to Jesus. It is about having the source in the right hands. And so Jesus miraculously multiplies the food, and there's so much that everyone has their fill. And he instructs them, collect the leftovers, which shows his heart for the poor and for those that don't have enough. And then he begins to make an exit because the people are coming for him. They have decided that this is the guy. They look at him and all of this abundance and they say, you know what? If this is what it's like when you're in charge, then you should always be in charge. Let's pick the person who is on our side and who's going to make sure all of our needs get met. That's how politics work. At this point, they're doing some math. They say, okay, Jesus' sky-high approval rating plus the expectation that the Messiah is going to be a king who will overthrow Rome and make the Jewish people the rulers equals the recipe for a political messiah. They want to use Jesus in politics to advance what they believe is God's will. And Jesus will not let himself be used in this way because this vision that they have is too narrow. It misses the point entirely. And we still see people corrupting Jesus' name this way today. Jesus does not want to be used. He wants to be believed. When people believe Jesus, 
when politicians look at Jesus and say, I will be influenced by this, I will do the same, we get people like Martin Luther King Jr. and Desmond Tutu and Cardinal Oscar Romero who fought for human rights and the poor in El Salvador and was assassinated for it. We get remarkable men and women when Jesus influences politics. But at this moment, that is so rife with opportunity for Jesus himself, he chooses to walk away. He is not there to be an earthly king, and he does not choose the path that leads to earthly success. He will choose the one that leads to suffering. And so he goes and he prays to the Father, probably expressing sadness that not one person in this crowd, not once do we read that someone has given the glory to God for what has happened. Their physical needs have been met, but they have not received the spiritual provision that Jesus came to give them. So now we move into part B of the story. The disciples, they are starting to learn Jesus's rhythms. They see what's happening. They too know it's time to go. So they pack up, they go to the boat. They see that Jesus isn't there. They start rowing, knowing that he's going to catch up. They do the right thing. They just saw a miracle, and so they're moving ahead with all of this faith and hope and love and joy about what's going to happen next. And then very suddenly, a fierce storm comes down upon them. Other translations actually describe it as a gale, which means wind strong enough to knock down a tree. And they start rowing against it, and they row for hours, and they must have been yelling instructions to each other and, and taking turns rowing because that's what you have to do when you're in a storm like that. They spend eight, nine hours on the water. They have no strength left, and the wind will not stop. When you are in a storm like this, the rain is not the problem. Rain will just run off the side of the boat. But if you have wind, the waves will get bigger and bigger, and then there's no protection for the boat. So hunger can kill you, and wind can kill you. If hunger is about to kill you, you need someone that can give you bread. But if wind is about to kill you, you need somebody that can walk on water. And they look up, and there he is. He's standing on the water, and this is the first thing that will really and fully convince them because this is power. It's Jesus. He's standing right there on the water in front of them, and he's saying, do not be afraid. I am here. Some translations just have, I am. He was walking on the water, showing his dominion over the earth, showing us the dominion that Adam once had. And the scriptures say that they willingly, they eagerly took him into the boat. You know, deep down, we miss God all the time. But we really miss him when we're in the middle of a storm. They're in the storm, and they eagerly take him in. And the moment that they do, it says they arrive at their destination. Observation number one. Is there room for Jesus in your boat? Is there space for Jesus in your boat right now? Some of us are happy about the election. Some of us are sad about the election. Some of us feel relief about the election. Some of us feel conflicted about the election, but regardless of where you stand or who you voted for, I think we can all agree that we are in the middle of a storm right now. And it isn't a storm that began on Tuesday. This storm started quite a while ago. 
Is there room for Jesus in your boat? It's a fair question, and it's a sincere question. Because as a concept, Jesus is small. Jesus, as a concept, doesn't take up much room at all. The imagined Jesus will take on whatever shape we want him to have. He does whatever we want him to do. He agrees with everything that we think. The concept of Jesus doesn't ask us to die to ourselves, doesn't require any change, doesn't expect you to actually love your enemies. The concept of Jesus doesn't take up much room at all. But the real Jesus will rock the boat. When the real Jesus, not the concept of Jesus, the real Jesus comes into our lives, he will take up space because he is big. He is God in the flesh. He is I am. He is the same I am from Isaiah 44 who said, I am the Lord. I made all things. I made every single person in this room. I stretched out the heavens. I spread out the earth by myself. He is the same I am from Psalm 33 who said, by the word of his mouth were the heavens made and by the breath of his mouth all their host, who gathers the waters of the sea as a heap, who puts the deeps in storehouses. He is the same I am from Psalm 24, the one who in Psalm 23 promised to be your shepherd and lead you to green pastures and still waters and anoint your head with oil. And then in Psalm 24, will tell you that he founded the earth upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. This I am is big. And if he's taking up only a little bit of room in your life and he seems satisfied, he's a concept. But if he's causing you to rethink everything, everything, if he's causing you to scoot over and make space, then he's real and he's big. And as we go through this storm together, And whenever we go through personal storms, because this election isn't the only thing happening, many of us have personal storms happening right now. Those storms are not a sign that Jesus doesn't care. It's just the B. A, B, A. It's not the full story. This too shall pass. The real story is that God is good. Never let a storm make you forget that. The ABA story that God is still telling says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have already overcome the world. The story that God is telling says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall never perish, but shall have everlasting life. The story that God is telling says that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, there was a criminal hanging next to him. And the criminal said, Jesus, will you remember me in your kingdom? And Jesus said, I will. And because of that, we get to join him in paradise. Jesus came to them in the storm. And when we are in a storm, he comes to us too. Don't ever hesitate to pull him into the boat. Now the A, the final part of the story that we move into now, was actually covered by Vito in a message not long ago called The Bread of Life. I encourage you to go back and listen to it if you haven't already, so that you have a really good sense of what takes place after Jesus and the disciples get off of their boat. 
most of what happens is a conversation between Jesus and the same crowd that he has now healed and fed. And Jesus says, you followed me again, not because you really understand who I am, but because you saw the signs and the wonders. And he says, but I am the bread of life, and you're going to have to live off of me if you truly want to live. Now, what's interesting is that for 43 verses, for 43 verses, the disciples, they say absolutely nothing at all not until the very end. There were actually additional disciples present. And as we heard read, they struggled with Jesus' words so much that they decide to abandon him altogether. And when that happens, Jesus turns to the original 12 disciples and he says, are you going to leave me too? And the Bible says in verse 68 and 69, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter and the other disciples from the boat stayed. I, I, I mean, they, they're, they're looking at him. Their clothes are dry by this point, but it's probably still got all of that residue that happens when you get salt water all over yourself. They, they were so close to dying, and they look at him, and they decide to stay because they see, they really see that Jesus not only has power, he has purpose. He came to save our lives. He didn't just come to meet our needs. He came to save our lives. And so they look at him, this I am, who just saved their lives, and they realize that even if all of their needs were met, even if they had a king that could give them back all of their power, they would still need a savior. Observation two, even if all of our needs were met, we would still need a savior. We know that each and every single person is special. All human beings are because they're made in the image of God. And we know that we have needs that go far beyond clothing and food. Those are very important things and they matter, but we have very deep needs, much deeper than that. Every human being has needs that are just too complex for other people to fix. Vito said that in his bread sermon. We need someone else. We need a savior. And so what does all of this mean for us? The disciples needed to be saved from a storm, but what is it that we need to be saved from? Our sin? Our idols? Look at the way we hurt each other. Look at the way we lose control and we get addicted. Look at the way we struggle to break out of patterns and habits. We haven't even touched on the ways that we sin against God and the rest of his creation. Even if our needs were met, even if our house was big, even if we had the perfect spouse, even if we had the job of our dreams, even if the person that you wanted to be president was always the president for the rest of your life and every Supreme Court ruling went the way you wanted it to go and every local politician did whatever you wanted them to do, we would still need a savior because we need to be healed and we need to be forgiven and we need someone that can save our lives and not just physically save us, but eternally save us. And thankfully, someone else already made that happen for us. The disciples look at Jesus, and we should look at Jesus and realize that only he can do that. Everything he does in the end is life-saving. And the only thing that Jesus didn't save was himself. He came into this world, he gave himself up, 
and he saved us. May his power and his purpose be a blessing to everyone in this room and to everyone listening on the podcast. And may it convince us to follow him further. Let's pray. I want to give you more room and more space, Jesus. Take up the room. Take up the honor. Take up the glory. Take up the praise that's only due to you. Thank you, Jesus, for being who you are for being more than we can think, ask, or imagine, for rescuing us from our storms, for saving our lives. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. May the power and the purpose that we believe in and that we have taken hold to this morning, may it flood out of this place with us. May we carry it into every interaction we have this week. May you use us, Lord, as holy vessels. We love you so much, Jesus. We love you so much. Amen.